swinging from Carson's Pennsylvania farm to a New Jersey suburb of New York City to meet with 14-time Grammy winner, Latin jazz musician and classical composer Paquito de Rivera and his two-time Grammy-winning manager, fellow performer and wife, Brenda Feliciano. In their nearly 40 years together, Paquito and Brenda have recorded over 30 albums and performed around the globe with other world-class musicians, including Yo-Yo Ma, Dizzy Gillespie, and Wynton Marsalis. Well, 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 my collection of instruments. I have so many instruments at home. But I am mainly an alto player and a clarinet player. Those are the instruments that, that I play, and the soprano saxophone, too. Paquito welcomed roadshow appraiser Larry Cavallari to look at three of his most prized saxophones. You have three wonderful horns here, and I'd like to start with this uh, Martin tenor saxophone. Well, this was my father's saxophone. I grew up with that instrument. This is a 1942 Martin committee. My father ordered that instrument, uh, I think 1942, and he got it in 43. I was not born, but uh, he used to practice that horn 26 hours a day. <laughs> this is the horn that inspired me to be a, a musician because he played this instrument all the time. Now your father was a Selmer dealer in Havana, Cuba. Interesting story that. He always used to say, the Selmer is the best built instrument ever. Uh, but he never got you to play Selmer. He always played his Martin. The Selmer people never knew about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, by the serial number, you're correct. This is probably between 1940 and 1942 uh -huh. made, and it is marked Committee 2. It's commonly called the Lion and Crown model because it has a, a lion engraved and a crown on the top. And they're really a beautiful horn. They're made in Elkhart, Indiana. I didn't know about that lion stuff. Beautiful horns, they're still very much in demand in today's market. At a retail saxophone store nowadays, this horn would be worth between $4,000 and $4,500. Mm -hmm. Because of its association with you and your father, I would think that that would sell for between six and $7,000. So the next horn we'll appraise today is the King Super 20, made in Cleveland, Ohio, around 1950 by the serial number. What inspired you to, to buy this horn? Always I wanted to have a King Super 20 for many reasons. One is very pretty instrument. And the sound is very uh, uh, piercing. It, it's really strong and the, it's very elegant sound. These horns are also very collectible. At a retail store, this saxophone would probably bring between four and $5,000. Mm -hmm. The last horn that we're going to appraise today, Paquito, is in the middle here. This horn is so special for me. This is the first horn that my father gave to me. I was five years old. He ordered this instrument to the Selmer uh, company in 1953. My father told me how to play it and he presented it to me in public six months later. This, this was my first instrument and ever since I am still trying to learn how to play it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Selmer curved soprano, special order. Uh, it has two serial numbers on it, which is unusual, but the reason being, Selmer made only two runs of this horn, very small, less than a dozen each run. One was done between maybe 1945 and, and 1949, which was when this bell was made with the 38,000 serial number on it. Uh, and it mustn't have been used until 1954 in January when the super balanced action body tube was added here. So we have two separate serial numbers, one from 1949 and one from 1954. There's two dozen or thereabouts of these in existence. At five years of age, you were presented this horn by your dad. And how much did you practice? How often did you practice this horn? All the time. Mm -hmm. Always practicing the scales or, or transcribing Benny Goodman solos. Mm -hmm. In today's market, at a retail store, I believe this horn would bring somewhere between $12,000 and $18,000 mm. as a horn. But the association with you is going to raise the value. I feel that this horn could perhaps bring as much as 
$25,000 and maybe more, uh, uh, depending on whether people were willing to fight, <laughs> fight over it. It depends on the bank account on somebody. I am very honored to have my, my three favorite horns in my favorite show. <laughs> 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 it's not possible to get better tone out of a saxophone than that. That's really great. More treasures from Paquito and Brenda coming up. Jersey to see a treasure from Brenda Feliciano's childhood home. I grew up in Brooklyn. My parents were in the civil rights movement, so a lot of people in the movement came to the house, and one of them was this painter. Daddy got this painting from Ernie Krishlow, who I met as a kid. I am not sure who this young, beautiful child is, but uh, Daddy left me this, so this means a lot. If you can in give me some insight on this, I would love it. Ernest Critchlow was from Brooklyn himself. He was from an immigrant family. He was the second of nine children. Uh, his parents were from Barbados, and um, they lived next door to, to an Italian family, and they would babysit for each other. So uh, he grew up with that kind of feeling around him in terms of uh, people taking care of each other. That's right. Uh, but his work overall has always centered around civil rights. She's in profile and you can see she's kind of turning as opposed to a, a portrait painting, which is a frontal, frontal. Uh, head on portrait painting mm -hmm. that seems static. Here you, you have some movement captured. It's like a moment mm -hmm. in time. She almost seems surprised in a way. And what, what this does is, in addition to adding dynamism to the painting, it also gives and imparts a little bit of air of mystery. Critchlow himself often said that he was very interested in capturing the motion Mm -hmm. of, of the sitter. He was a master portrait painter. And she evokes to me a young girl that's in her Sunday best wearing her, her ribbon. And that's how I have looked at her, sort of like when I would go to church, you wear a little ribbon, and that's what she looks like. Exactly, you took the words right out of my mouth, but also she doesn't look necessarily uh, super happy, right? Apprehensive. Apprehensive, yes. something's going on. Mm -hmm. It's signed and dated. Uh, Ernest Critchlow, 1955. So we don't know who she is, but I think m more than anything, she's almost like a symbol of all other children during this difficult, very difficult mm -hmm. time. He was not one of those African-American artists who shied away from the subject matter. Mm -hmm. A lot of his works uh, had to deal very bluntly with oppression, overt racism. If I was going to put this painting at auction today, I would put a very conservative auction estimate on it of $3,000 to $5,000. And part of that is also because it's on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. There are a couple condition issues, as you can see here, just some scratches, mm -hmm. but those are easily taken care of. Mm -hmm. Look at that, wow, it's beautiful. Luciano got this painting from a famous friend. They tell Gene Shapiro it sings to them. I am the musical director for 24 years of the Punta del Este Jazz Festival. The first festival, the hotel that we stayed in, is called Casa Pueblo. Casa Pueblo was built by a wonderful, who, who is, in my opinion, the national painter of, uh, of Uruguay, Carlos Paez Viraró. And we become friends. And then in my 50th anniversary as a, as a musician, mm -hmm. I celebrated in 2004, mm -hmm. uh, he came, as, as a surprise, he came and, and gave to me this, uh, painting that I appreciate very much. What a wonderful gift. Can you tell me what these letters mean up here on the, uh, yeah, on the corner, it's, FY? It's Francisco Jovino, who is the founder of the Festival Internacional de Jazz de Punta del Este. That's how we met uh, Paez Villaro. Paez Villaro, he was born in 1923. He actually began his studies in Buenos Aires. But one of the other things that he did is that he studied music first. He, was, uh, he, was, he studied composition and he was a composer. I never knew that. We have to stay in touch with this guy, man. He knows everything. He knows everything. <laughs> and he actually had a band. He was very interested in, in African-inspired uh, music, Afro-Uruguayan, Afro-Brazilian music, and he was like an ethnographic musician. He was a true Renaissance man. It's painted on cardboard. The medium is some tempera and some ink as well. So the ink is uh, providing these really dark outlines of the musicians. We know what it's about, right? It's about a jazz band playing, yeah. right? Jazz quintet or something, yes. Yeah. The whole idea of this 
uh, is to almost hear the painting. It's hard to overstate the importance of jazz music on, on modern art as we know it. They are brother and sister. They are, they are, they are connected. Yeah. Um, and maybe you, here in this painting you feel it even more because Carlos was very close to, to Afro-Uruguayan music, which is very colorful. Mm -hmm. I, I think he even plays some of the drums and all that. What does candombe uh, sound like? It's a very dynamic music and very colorful. Have you ever thought about getting it valued? No, yeah. not really. We are terrible business people. <laughs> so, <laughs> if this painting was going to come to auction, I would put a conservative auction estimate on it of $4,000 to $6,000. Mm -hmm. I would put an insurance value on it of about $15,000. Oh. Good to know. Thank you so much for putting all this together into a cohesive, you know, understandable way to perceive. Now, when I look at this painting, I'm going to listen to the music it brings out, you know? Some candombe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a ball. I learned so much about what we have in our home, and I only wish we could have uh, learned more, because there's so much more stuff, so you guys got to come back. No, they, but you better stay here. She's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> and she can sing too, so you want to go. I have a lot of stuff there. Oh my God, and it's sculpture. <laughs> the beautiful sculpture, this sculpture there. They say you're not going to have I'll show one thing, one. No, no, just one. And I don't say us. the frame.